Hello, my name is Kevin Dorsey. I'm best known for my work with the amazing Michael Jackson over the course of 25 years as a background vocalist, uh, his vocal director, and assistant musical director. This is my interview with Red Jackson. I hope you enjoy. Excuse the plan for the fool like a fan. I can tell a guy now. Michael Cook, it ain't hard to change. And welcome everyone, I'm Red Jackson, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by the awesome Kevin Dorsey. How are you, Kevin? I'm doing great, Red, and thank you for having me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Can you sort of introduce yourself and tell my viewers a bit about your career, you know, when you started and who you've worked with and how you've sort of progressed? Uh, let me see, my career began uh, when Quincy Jones brought me to Los Angeles. And uh, my first big project uh, was a film that Q was scoring uh, called The Color Purple. Right. And uh, prior to that, uh, I did a film with myself, Saida Garrett, David Swanson, and Daryl Finnessy. We were singing uh, with Narada Michael Wallen on a film entitled Fast Forward that the daughter of Sidney Poitier uh, was directing. And from there, I've gone from working with everyone from the from Dolly Parton to the Motley Crew to oh. uh, eventually from films to Ferris Bueller, Forrest Gump, The Lion King, Spider-Man, uh, Austin Powers, The Matrix, and productions like that. And... Uh, and naturally to touring and working with the amazing Michael Jackson. Of course, of course, the one and only. Yes, the one and only, yeah. Now, we met at Kingvention last month, where we spoke briefly, but how would you sort of describe your experience there? What was it like for you? You know, it was, I had an enjoyable time because, I mean, it had been quite a while, naturally, since seeing the fans and being able to fraternize with the fans and, you know, hang out with them and take mm -hmm. pictures and, and sign autographs and, and being able to, you know, tell of my experiences with Michael. Yeah, of course. And, uh, to see the memorabilia, a lot of that brought back a lot of memories. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I just had a great time. The, the host, uh, and his staff, their staff, I mean, were super, super nice and, and, and always looking to, to help and make my stay comfortable. So I had a great time. Absolutely. Well, we spoke briefly at Kingvention, but it's great now to, you know, be able to go more in depth and ask you questions about your career and about your work with Michael that I've wanted to know for ages. But yeah. before we get to talking about Michael, I'd like to go way back to how you sort of began in the industry. So when did you decide that you wanted to become a professional vocalist and what was your sort of big break? Um, I was attending college at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And um, I was touring with their Glee Club, which is world renowned. And we were touring the West Coast. And uh, at that time, Quincy Jones was holding auditions, putting together what he was calling a super group to appear on the follow-up of, of his album that was entitled The Dude. Mm -hmm. So um, long story short, there were, I think they said close to 7,000 people from around the world auditioning for four positions. And uh, I went, I auditioned. Somehow I was the first of the four chosen. Wow. And wow. uh, and it and it went from there. Mm -hmm. It went from there, you know. Uh, I never thought I would be doing this as a profession. I thought I was going to end up one day being a 
professor at a college or something of this nature, but I'm still getting, uh, being able to teach and, uh, and loving what I do. I mean, I get to do a number of things. I mean, from, from voiceovers to, you know, commercials, to television, to film, as well as work, you know, with recording artists. Yeah, I mean, you've done it all. And you've worked with some of the most talented and the most well-known artists over the past few decades. But in particular, can you tell me a bit about your work with Whitney Houston and Frank Sinatra? Like, how did you end up working with them? And what did you work on? Uh, with uh, Sinatra, Quincy was producing uh, Sinatra's last record. Mm -hmm. And that's how I was able to get involved with that. Uh, with Whitney... Uh, Narada Michael Walden was producing uh, her first album uh, on Arista. And so a very good friend of mine, Jim Gilstrap, uh, called me and said, Kevin, I'd love for you to come and work on this. And that was her inaugural record. And uh, even though I've been fortunate enough to, to do a few of her records, but yeah. that was the first one with dance with somebody and all that stuff on it. And, uh, and it was funny because right after that or around the same time, uh, I was also doing uh, Aretha Franklin uh, with Pink Cadillac and who was Zoom and who and all that with mm -hmm. the same amazing producer and the writer Michael Walden. Mm -hmm. And what was Whitney like to work with? You know, it was, she was, a, a regular person I mean and the greatest thing about it if you want to call it great I mean it's always and it depends when you have the artist there while you're working sometimes it's great sometimes you know some people may think it's too much pressure because you're trying to make an impression on them mm, of course uh, but uh, the majority of the times I mean it was it was just us with Narada, mm. so um, and and she was like I said, just regular people, you know. But I mean, we get get a chance to see artists in a different light than the consumer and or the fan, right. you know. We, yeah. we get to see them as as they are, you know, and uh, which you learn to respect because mm -hmm. you know a lot of times you need to close the curtain and turn the lights off, you know, and come off the stage and just be yourself. Yeah. And and that's what I love about what I do, you know. I love just being able people can be themselves around me. Even yeah. though even though they're world renowned, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. And you've also worked on some classic, classic movies, such as The Lion King, The Matrix, Spider-Man, Star Wars, The Little Shop of Horrors, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I mean, wow. So when it comes to motion pictures like these, what exactly is your role? Uh, a lot of times my role will be uh, as, a, as a vocalist. Yeah. Uh, because so many times when you get people amazing people such as John Williams, Hans Zimmer, yeah. and I right. mean, and all of these amazing composers, they will uh, enlist the services of a, of a choir to be pretty much the vocal orchestra to go along with the, uh, with the orchestra. Yeah. And so, I mean, that has been it. On occasions, I've had a chance to arrange some of that uh, I've had a chance to naturally compose my own. And uh, it's, you get to do voiceover, you know, if animation. I mean, back in the day when we were doing Ferris Bueller with uh, Ira Newborn was a composer. And that's when I got a chance to do my very first voiceover, which was, you know, oh yeah. Oh yeah, 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 I know. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's great not to be pigeonholed into just saying you're a background vocalist, you're a this, you're a musician, you're a blah, when you can do pretty much be a jack of all trades, Absolutely. But, 
on the producing side, not being a master of none, making sure that you call the best to make your vision, you know, be exactly the best it can be. Yeah. You know, it's, that, that's what I enjoy doing. That's great. And now I'd like to move on to discuss your work with the one and only Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. You worked with him extensively and you were a key part of his career. But how and when did you first, first begin working with him? The first time I worked with Michael uh, was actually with his brothers and himself preparing for the victory tour. And, uh, and that, once again, came by way of Quincy Jones. And when it came down to working with Mike uh, as a, his first solo tour, uh, Daryl Fennessy uh, called me because I, I, they were holding auditions. And at that time, I was on the Dolly Parton show. I was in her band. And, uh, and Daryl said, man, we're, Michael's getting ready to do his first solo tour. It's going to be this, going to be that. Won't you come and audition? And I said, sure. And it was Daryl, Dorian Holly, Cheryl Crow, and myself. And we met at Daryl's and did a little rehearsal. We didn't, we did one or two uh, Michael tunes just to do it. But the main thing we did when we auditioned, we did jazz just to, to show how our harmonies could lock, where yeah. we were vocally. And uh, right, we got the gig found out that night that we had the gig and uh and then started rehearsing for bad so you all sort of knew each other before the battle yes uh i knew daryl and cheryl because we uh worked in the studio together doing right. from commercials to other records it was my first time uh working with dorian mm -hmm. yeah mm-hmm do you remember your first meeting with Michael? What was your sort of first impression of him? Uh, my first meeting with Michael, once again, was uh, with, with the Jacksons, with the brothers. And uh, he was very cordial. Uh, and it was very, I mean, I was a new kid on the block, you yeah. know. So I just uh, met, did what I need to do on the gig and, and see you. But yeah. uh when it came down to the bad tour, um, it slowly but surely, he kind of chooses, or should I say he chose who he would, he's cordial to everyone, but he would choose who he warmed up to, if you will. And yeah, I get it. Whoever, you know, he would, he, he would let in, mm. you know. So uh, I always have and always will be just myself. And and I think that's one of the main reasons where he just said you you never change, and he and it made him feel comfortable, you know. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So you worked on the bad tour, the dangerous tour, and the history tour, and I mean it must have been just an incredible experience to tour the world and perform that many shows. What would you say was the highlight of each tour for you if you had to choose just one? Or, or, um, must be a tough question. Um, the highlight that that is a tough one. I mean, to to uh, to just pick moments. I mean, yeah. one of my favorite moments naturally had to be uh, in London at Wembley uh, when with uh, Princess Diana and yeah. uh, Prince Charles came to our dressing room before we were going on stage and he asked Michael not to perform Dirty Diana. And uh, Michael said, yes. And then uh, Princess Diana came after that to make a long story short and said, I want you to sing it like you've never sung it before. <laughs> oh, and so, we did and looked over in the royal box, you know, Prince Charles was <laughs> That's pretty. And, and she was up getting her groove on. So yeah. so that I mean that was a highlight. I mean, there have been so many. Mm. You know, okay. um 
And so it would really, that's one that just really stands out. And between the tours, the group of vocalists, you know, it was clinking, had different people coming in and out. So why was that? And how did that change the dynamic and the sound of the group? Um, when it came to the dynamic and the sound of the group, as far as the interchanging of personnel, um, Cheryl uh, went on to uh, embark on a solo career, a very successful solo career. Yeah. Mind. <laughs> uh, and we... Uh, we uh, used Saida Garrett and also Marva Hicks, and uh, whom we just recently lost, as a matter of fact. Um, we uh, male, we used Fred White, uh, and we used also Romeo Johnson, and and the people that I I chose to interchange, if you will. I mean. I knew of their talents. I knew of their vocal abilities. Mainly, I knew of their personalities because yeah. you have to live with these people and work with these people on the road for, you know, for months and months and months. Yeah. And you just need the personalities to be able to work as well as their talents, as well as knowing that person, making sure they're going to be able to get along and coexist with Michael. You know, which is which is number one. Would you say that the personality and the work ethic is more important than the talent? I would say they go hand in hand. Yeah. They go hand in hand. I mean, naturally, you're not going to be there if you can't do the job. Yeah. You can be the nicest person, the sweetest person, and everyone loves you. But if you sound like a bullfrog with a cold, it's <laughs> You know, you're not going to do us any any good on stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah of so your talent is what got you there. Your personality and work ethic is what will keep you there. Definitely. Mm -hmm. With Michael, when you were performing, what was the most challenging song for you? Um, believe it or not, starting something. Really? Why? Uh, because Michael, when touring... He runs songs at what we call show tempo. Right. So what you hear on the album and or CD, I mean, you can almost not double the tempo, but he likes it very, very fast to get the audience involved in and just get the hype of the show going. And so when you start off, it's just the mama say, mama say, mama kusa, mama say, mama say, mama kusa. When you're doing that at 100 miles an hour and you're moving and it's hot on that stage and you have to make sure of your pitch, your tone, that that's the most uh, challenging for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about a favorite or a least favorite song to perform? least favorite song to perform um um for me it was bad yeah it was boring to to perform for me bad bad really really bad the whole world going out that it was it was just uh nothing moved me in that song yeah okay yeah um favorite songs to do were um always for me because of the meanings behind them um man in the mirror but even more so than that uh earth song mm. yeah that's a great one um just especially once we get into the van you know listening to what is being said in the song you know my favorite song and the show was always one I didn't perform, and that was Human Nature. Oh, right, right, right. Did you get to watch Michael? I get to. I watched him do that a million times, and I never missed. That's the only break I get in the show. Yeah. And uh, I'd always stand on the side of the stage and watch. I spoke with Rory Kaplan, who played keyboards on the Bad Tour. Um, I spoke with him a few weeks ago. 
and he said that Michael told him that his favorite song to perform was Human Nature too. Mm -hmm. At that I mean, time. it's uh, because that song embodies all of the legends that he has, I'll say, borrowed from, from, from Fred Astaire to Danny Kaye to Sammy Davis. I mean, every lyric, no movement was wasted. Every lyric and movement had a meaning, you know. And every night I got a chance to watch a master at work. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I always tell people if there's one regret that I had after 25 years of, of working with Slim, it was I never got a chance to watch the show. Yeah, of course, yeah. You know, I would have loved to have been out in that audience just to to see the circuits, yeah. you know. I would have loved to have done that, but I was kind of busy. <laughs> yeah, but it yeah. must have been, you know, a really different sort of feel, you know, to be watching it, you know, rather than, you know, being behind and on stage. Yeah, you know? yeah, very much so, because, I mean, you had to, when you spoke earlier of, of work ethic, you had to be so on top of your game. Mm. You, I don't care how you felt, I don't care how you, what. When those light, house lights went down, it was it was time to go to work. Mm. And however you feel now, you, you put that in your, back, in your back pocket, you can bring it out two hours and 26 minutes later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. How did you and the other vocalists react to being told that you'd have to, you know, dance and be moving all the time instead of, you know, just singing? Because the tours were always so high energy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fun. I mean, we enjoyed that aspect of it. Yeah. You know, uh, that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, even with the choreography, you still had to know why you were there and what, what your job was. You know, you can sit up there and, and move like Lavelle and the guys. That's all great. Your concentration was that microphone, you mm -hmm. know. So limit what you're doing over there. Don't get lost in the in the choreography, forgetting about what you had to do behind that mic, you know. But it was fun. It was fun. We, we enjoyed it. We had fun doing it. Um, some of the big, big numbers, I mean, were just you knew why Michael was in the shape that he was because that really takes it out of you, you know, mm -hmm. and to be there and make sure that you're on top of what you're doing. Yeah. On the Dangerous tour, mm -hmm. Michael opened the show with, you know, that really powerful performance of Glam. Mm -hmm. He approached to perform the live rap verse. Heavy D did it originally. Yeah. And uh, it was just, hey, you know, Kevin, this is what you're going to do. Mm. And because at the time, uh, who was it? I think Brad, by then it was Brad and uh, and Isaiah or and Greg was there for, for some of that as far as splitting the MD uh, things. But I mean, I just I just did it and kept doing it. I did that. Daryl uh, would do uh, the rap on black or white. And uh, and then later, uh, during uh, the other tours, I ended up doing them both. Yeah. You know, that and throwing the dynamite out on Dangerous and, you know, just having fun, you know. Just, mm -hmm. and so we split it up and where everyone gets a chance to do what they need and, and whatever. And then Mike always has the last say about who does what. Yeah, that's part that's of what I love about Michael's shows. He sort of gave everyone their own sort of solo moment to shine. Like you said, mm -hmm. Daryl doing black and white. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, but I just can't stop loving you. Everyone just sort of had their moment. Yeah, and Dorian got to do I'll Be There. 
mm-hmm. you know. And uh, Daryl got to do I'll Be There also at one time. So, yeah, everyone had their time to shine. You must have performed that jam verse, you know, a lot of times. Do you still remember it? Oh, yeah, jam, jam, here comes a man. Oh, damn, the big boy stands moving up a hand, making funky tracks with my man Michael Jackson, smooth criminal, that's the man Mike, so relax. Mingo, mingo, jingle in the jungle, bum rush to the door, three and fours in a bundle. Execute the plan, plus I cool like a fan. I got the tenant in my guy now with Michael, because it ain't hard to jam. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Now, tell me how you made that transition from being, you know, Michael's vocalist to becoming the vocal director and assistant music director. Well, uh, when Brad Buxer took over as MD, uh, we worked quite well together on the musical side. I mean, I'm a, I'm a musician also. Yeah. So, uh, and then um, I, when it comes to just the vocals and studying everything that Michael, Michael was very, very insistent on capturing all the nuances of his background vocals because other than the large uh, choral type things. Michael did all his own backgrounds. Mm-hmm. So he was very, I mean, and it wasn't until bad and things like that to where he began to trust other people to to do some backgrounds, you know. And uh but his background vocals were very, very tight, very, very precise. Mm-hmm. And yep. he liked to do a lot of cluster harmonies and um you had to pay a lot of attention especially when you had sometimes there were six parts and there are only four of us on stage you know so yeah. i mean i had to make sure that i chose if i was going to leave out two they were going to be two that were going to make the least amount of difference if you will you know and then that way, the the chord uh, cluster that we did do, you know, was going to be the one that the fans were, ah, there's that harmony, there's that lush harmony that, that yeah. we know of with Michael. So, I mean, and if there was something that he would rather, well, Kevin, I'd rather you add this note than that note, then he would say it, you yeah. know? I mean, he was... The only time, like I said, uh, starting something, and he was really, really adamant about Billy Jean. That I mean, he, I think that was one of the only times that he would come. He came over and said, "Guys, I need you to," uh, uh, because Billy Jean is so percussive. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. So he was very, very adamant about the backgrounds of Billy Jean as well as the bass part on Billy Jane because of the influxion. He was just very, very, I mean, he had this thing about the percussive aspect of his vocals and he needed to hear it and he was going to hear it. As a vocal director, were you just sort of, you know, listening to Michael's feedback and, you know, working with the background vocalist? Or did you ever work with Michael on his vocals? Or was that always like Michael and Seth Riggs? You know, that was always uh, Michael and Seth Riggs. Yeah. You know, yeah, I never, uh, I was not, even though some people uh, were saying that I was his vocal coach or Dorian was his vocal coach or something like that. No, that's, that's not to my knowledge, speaking for myself, no, we were not. I mean, that was something that Seth did. I mean, my my job were the background vocals and anything that uh, needed to be assisted with as far as the band. But yes, yeah. I, I never was a vocal coach to Mike. Now, how was lip sync used in Michael's performances? Because the fans are torn on this, and I know I'd personally would like to have this clarified you know how and when was it exactly used um when it came to that it was not as much as people would have thought i mean 
like you, I've seen a lot of the videos, a lot of our live performances. A lot of times you see the, uh, whether the film is behind or chasing the audio or back and forth, or it's not locking up or whatever. Um, but when it came to that actually on tour, because of such a high energy show, um, we did run um, what we call, we ran track with us live. Whenever mm -hmm. he needed a break after such a huge dance break, there was always a signal to uh, track and then a signal to come back live. Mm -hmm. And it was used uh, the, the and I hate the the term lip sync, but the yeah. track was, the track was used pretty much as an athlete. If you're a basketball player and you need a breather, you know, we don't get a chance on stage to time out, yeah. you know. So that track was his time out. Yeah, and it, and it would average it average ah, what thirty seconds maybe. That's Just, it. Wow. As long as him. He could gather himself. I'm good. There you go. And here we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as well, far as like people... Michael couldn't sing, I mean, you know, no, I saw... they put themselves in his shoes, you know, dancing like that. Yeah. You know, as far as people saying, you know, the whole thing was this was lip sync, the whole song, and this and that. No, no, it was it was strategically done, and and my goodness, we did it to make sure that the fans and the audience, I mean, got the best and most out of our shows, you know, and plus it helped keep him healthy. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. When I watch videos of Michael, like, you know, recordings of the performances, sometimes it's, you know, the studio track sort of being used. So is that typically edited and, you know, just sort of put over? When when you're watching live performances? Yeah. Um. It depends. Um, I when, when it comes to those things, naturally, we don't have anything to do with that. I mean, I've I've heard it also, you know, and I've said, okay, that's that's uh, that's that's just this track, or that's just that, and I don't know if they felt it locked up better with that performance. If something happened during that form performance, if there was a, a live glitch that we may have had during that show where there was some audio problems, you never know. But, you know, I, I've seen that, I've heard that, and hey, it is what it is. That's really interesting and great insight there. Thank you, Kevin. Before we continue with the interview, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, MJ Market. Michael Jackson Market is a business created by passionate fans who believe that all collectors should have access to rare and unique items at a great price. They source their items from all over the world so that you don't have to, and they provide a great buying experience. So if you want any type of Michael Jackson memorabilia, whether it's clothing or books or magazines, go to michaeljacksonmarket.com for the best quality at the best price. You can also check them out on Instagram, at michaeljacksonmarket. Thank you once again to Michael Jackson Market for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the interview. Did you have a favorite country or a favorite venue or even, you know, a favorite show that you did with Michael? Maybe the Super Bowl? Uh, the Super Bowl was fun. Mm -hmm. um, that was, you know, he was the first, you know, superstar to do an actual uh, NFL halftime show. So that was fun. Um, it it didn't really have the same uh, effect as as a show, should I say? I mean, yeah. it's not like playing India and you have a million people that want to come in the stadium and can't, mm. or you know. Like I said, Wembley, uh, Tokyo, uh, Munich, Berlin. I mean, there, uh, 
when you played around the world, I mean, it's all, yeah, it's always great to come home and perform, you know, uh, but the halftime of the Super Bowl, I mean, hey, the feature was the football game, you know, but uh, it was fun. Uh, we had a great time doing it. And once it was over, it was time to get back to real work, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about any mishaps or funny moments that happened on stage? Because, I mean, you did so many shows. Surely there's, you know, something went wrong every now and then. Uh, let me see. Uh, a mishap that wasn't funny was when we were doing, we were doing Earth Song, and I think we were in Seoul, Korea. And yeah. in Earth Song, we have a bridge that comes up where I lead some people one way and Dorian leads people the other way. And Michael is on a bridge above us that comes down and joins the bridge and everybody goes to happiness. His, his comes down, it didn't stop. All the way into the, into the orchestra pit. And he did not stop singing. Yeah. It's falling that far. And he was injured. Uh, with that um so that was crazy uh also we had as you know we would uh had a scene in the show where he reenacted what happened at tenement square with the with the army tank right yeah i know yeah. and uh and he does this you know just being in front of the tank to stop it the tank wouldn't stop the tank kept coming kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, and they couldn't stop it. And they had to finally pull the plug, and then it stopped with him at the edge of the stage. Okay. So that was a mishap. Yeah. Uh, another mishap. Like we were, were we in Korea again, where he goes out on the cherry picker doing Beat It. Yeah, I know. And I jumped up and, and grabbed the cherry picker, and Michael had to hold him. And continue singing, beat it. Had he let him go, the guy would have fell to his death. Yeah. You know, so things like that were a little interesting, you know. And sometimes the fans, you know, seem like they go a bit too far. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, as they say, that's rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And am I right in saying that you worked on the rehearsals for the cancelled HBO concert with Michael? Yes. How did yeah. that differ from other Michael performances? Uh, that was a... Nothing ever went, nothing went right. No? You know, um, there were so many things that were just undecided and, and, and couldn't... I mean, the idea was going to be great. Yeah. I mean... We were there, I mean, we rehearsed for quite some time, you know, I mean, he was trying to reenact the street lamp, you know, with the old Sinatra like he did when he was a kid. I mean, a lot of different things we were going to do. Um, and it just never, it could never uh, reach a, there, there were so many different creative differences mm -hmm. that yeah. you could tell uh, he was getting more and more unhappy uh, with what was going on. I mean, it every day something would go wrong and every day he was unhappy. And so it's not doing it. You know, it just, things were just bad. That was it. I mean, just day in and day out, week in and week out. And uh, no matter what happened, uh, I think the whole thing evolved around creative differences. Yeah. You know, uh, naturally, uh, he did collapse during that time. I mean, literally two feet away from me uh, when he collapsed. And um, it was just... Uh, uh, one of those things. I mean, it's it's interesting you brought that up. I'd forgotten all about that. Mm. Forgotten all about that show. I mean, because 
it never happened. Yeah. And uh, but it could have, it should have, and in my opinion, I just don't think they. I mean, they listen to him. I mean, my God, it's it's his show. I know some people have been hired to direct and do this and do that and everything else, but my goodness, he had a vision. And I think everyone else had a vision also. And and I felt they felt their vision was more important than Michael's, you know. Yeah. And that was sad, but true. That's interesting. And it's, you know, interesting for the fans to hear what could have been. Do you mm-hmm. remember any other examples of, you know, what numbers were going to be in that show and how they were different? Smooth was different. Dangerous was different. Um, oh my goodness, what I, I, I remember those mainly, I mean, because, because we were in New York and on Broadway, if you will, uh, they were adding some showtime flair to yeah. some of the songs. I mean, a lot of theater, if you will. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had, my goodness, six, 16 dancers. Wow, that's a lot. Um, yeah, it was, it was very, it was very different. It was mm-hmm. very different. I mean, a lot was the same, but a lot was different. I mean, we, we had as singers, we had more choreography. Um, there was just more, like I say, it was more like a Broadway performance. Yeah. And it, and they can say what they want to. It was not going the way that uh, that he wanted, you know. And right. And, and so, and I, I think they couldn't, didn't want to agree to disagree, and so it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Now, on a more positive note, you also worked on the majority of Michael's albums. Which did you work on, and what was your exact role? Uh, and just as a vocalist. And uh, Bad, uh, let me see, what's what's after, what's after Bad? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't do anything on, I don't think I did anything on Dangerous. Um, what was after Dangerous? Uh, History? Yes. And uh, and then the blood on the dance floor stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anything after bad. Yeah. yeah. And, and were you, as a vocalist, in the studio with Michael, or would you just come in afterwards? Uh, both. Mm-hmm. Both, yeah. And what was it like, you know, being in the studio with Michael Jackson recording an album? How was that? Um, it it was. You know, when you when you work with someone so much, it's. I, I wish I could say it was just so very different, mm-hmm. with the exception of. He is in the studio as he is on stage as he he's he's a perfectionist. Yeah. And uh, he knows exactly what he wants, how he wants it, and will not stop until it's like that. So yeah. would you say that his sort of, you know, work ethic and his behavior in the studio was similar to how it was in the rehearsals for the tours? Uh, similar. Uh, but in the studio, it was more so that's the beginning of the magic. Yeah. And when you talk about the beginning of the magic, I mean, there are no, it's from sun up to sundown. Uh, I don't care if it's just one line, that line won't be right until he says it's right. It mm-hmm. take three days to do that in one line, you know? I mean, and that's, that's, people don't realize what goes into making that magic. Yeah. A lot of time, um, a lot of effort. I mean, it's nothing for him to come in the studio. I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. And it's two or three in the morning. 
You know, I mean, there's when you're creating perfection, there's a clock doesn't exist. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you worked on some early rehearsals for This Is It. How were you approached to work on that? Did Michael contact you? I was contacted by uh, Michael and uh, Kenny Ortega. Mm -hmm. And we began to uh, have meetings of what This Is It was going to consist of. And that was myself, Kenny Ortega, uh, LaBelle Smith. And uh, those were the initial meetings. And uh, and we would go through a lot of things. And then uh, uh, LaBelle brought Travis in. And it was, we, we just started, you know, woodshedding on what Mike wanted, what it was going to consist of, what it was going to be. Because initially, this is it, consisted of 15 shows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, we, um, I started putting the band together and, uh, and, and got it together, got the singers put together. And when we, one thing I will correct you is I was never in uh, any of the rehearsals. Right, okay. No, so I, I, was, I was only in the meetings right. bringing everything together. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it came to our first rehearsal, uh, when I got up to the gate, security gate, and they said, uh, you're not clear to enter. And I'm just like, you know, not being possible. Don't you know who I am? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, and next thing you know, uh, Paul Gongaware from AEG uh, came out after a while and uh, said, Michael has had a change of mind of who he wants to use. That doesn't sound like Michael. No, no, not at all. And I said, huh? He said, yeah, yeah. And uh, then I looked and I saw Kenny stick his head out the door and and they said he's had a change of heart. I said, oh, okay. And I left. And the next day I, I, I called Evie over at the office and she said, Kevin, where are you? I said, I'm at home. She said, what are you doing home? Why aren't you at practice? at rehearsal. I said, what do you mean why I'm, I'm not at rehearsal? I said, they said Michael had a change of heart. He doesn't he doesn't need me. And he doesn't need Lavelle and he doesn't need Greg and he doesn't need Brad. And uh she said, what are you talking about? And I told her what happened. She said Michael doesn't know anything about that. You know, and so uh even even with before that I um they hired a new the new musical director. Um I even forget his name. Michael uh, Bearden. What was his name? Michael Bearden. Yeah, Bearden from Chicago. And uh I uh, they told me we have a new musical director and I said, Okay. And and uh, they gave me his number and I called to welcome him or whatever and i i got a very ice cold uh reception from him and uh, i said oh, oh well you know goodness we'll see you at rehearsal so i mean it was in my personal opinion um anyone that was close to michael i felt that they were trying to alienate yeah and and keep away from him. Why? I don't know. You know, I don't I don't know what their reasoning was behind it. I know whatever it was, it, it wasn't to benefit Michael. And um it was sad. It was sad because I mean prior to that we had just lost David Williams, you know, and uh 
I always remember when Michael said he'd never tour without David. And uh, and he didn't, you know. So it was uh, strange. It, it was very, very strange. And uh, you can call me a hater or whatever you'd like to call me. I'm, I'm glad it didn't happen. Mm. You know, because this this is it wasn't I have not watched it in its entirety. No. You know, because uh I I've, I've heard too many things from people that I know who were there and uh how it was cut, how it was this, how it was that. And uh and that Michael himself was only I think he attended three rehearsals. Other than that, he was rehearsing with the dancers at his home. He wouldn't even come to the rehearsal studio, to the rehearsal hall. Hmm. You know, so they, they got those clips from three rehearsals that he attended. Once again, from what I hear, you know, and, and hell, they have no reason to lie to me, you know. But uh, it was it was horrible. I, I feel had it been the 15 shows and and whoever had stuck to their promise of what it was supposed to be. Yeah. I, I think it would have been amazing. It would have been fantastic. But from what I hear, I mean, it, it's tough to go from 15 shows to almost, I think what was the last thing I heard was going to stretch close to three years you know and uh that's not what he wanted yeah i think it would have been great you know to just sort of have that last concert for the fans but then yeah. it seemed they kept stretching him and you know trying to make more money out of it in a way we uh i mean everyone everyone in the band the dancers everyone i mean we were all waiting for that call and and uh and they said okay we got that call guys this is what we've been waiting for here's here's that last swan song here we go yeah you know and got all the build and ready to build and build and then kaplum mm -hmm. you know oh so it was i mean you know not even jennifer i mean it was yeah. I mean, everyone who was who had who had done it and had just made I don't know it, it was just it's just very disheartening and yeah. I, and I have my thoughts of what was behind it and you know I. I was one when he passed. I was one of the only ones. I, I didn't do any interviews. Mm, yeah. I, I, did, I did my first interview. Uh, I was probably a year or so later. You know, with uh, with Rolling Stone, and I only did that because they had always been fair to Mike, and they would allow me to read it prior to going to print. Yeah. You know, but to me, a lot of other people chose to financially capitalize from his death and uh, that's something they have to live with yeah yeah now um, can i ask was that band that you assembled the same one as we see in the film or did they change the band uh the only let me see jonathan yeah uh Tommy Organ. Yeah. And that's it. That's it. Wow. No one else. No one else. Can you tell me, you know, did you, Brad, Greg, Ravel, all sort of, you know, discuss what had happened after, you know, being at the security gates? Did you almost feel betrayed by Kenny Ortega and AEG? You know, um, we, you know, spoke here 
and 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 there i mean it's one of those things red where you when you've been doing this for so very long yeah you this is hollywood you never know what can happen and uh you know i lavelle and i spoke about it at length i mean and i've learned speaking about it wasn't going to change anything mm -hmm. um it was sure you have your opinions about Kenny, Paul Gongaware, and other members of that AEG team, you know, but uh, it's one of those things where you'll never know the truth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can't just, I'd love to be able to point the finger and say, it, and say wow, it was you that that caused it because yeah. when Michael started seeing his people disappear, I mean, I'm sorry, it reminds me of New York. I mean, no one is listening to me. No one is doing blah, 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 blah. And anytime you've done that to him, he's backed away. He's taken steps back and but this is it. Okay. I'll stay at home and rehearse with the dancers. I'm not coming, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, so many of us looked forward to that show because I think it was going to be probably his greatest. Yeah. You know, um, it's people always in entertainment, people always remember how you open and how you close. And my favorite tour was always the bad tour. That's how we opened. And this is it was going to be the close. Mm -hmm. You know, that was going to be the finale. Yeah. And uh, everyone knew that. So everyone wanted to have their hand in it creatively, financially. And uh, as my mom used to say, it just end ended up being too many cooks in the kitchen you know yeah, for sure and, and nothing ever got prepared it's such a shame though that you know that never got to happen and michael you know sadly passed away so early at such a young age it's, yeah. it's tragic yes yes yeah so thank you so much that was you know a really great answer and we got some great info there especially on such a delicate topic so thank you kevin You're more than welcome to discuss something you know a bit more positive all right favorite memory of your time working with Michael? Oh, man. My favorite times were believe it or not rehearsals. Rehearsals were I mean, torture because they would be hours, hours upon hours. Mm. And, I mean, you would We'd run run the show, take a little break, run it again. I mean, but you could get down to man in the mirror. Forty seconds out, there's a, somebody misses a lighting cue. There's a bad note. There's a dot. He's ah, 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 that can't happen in the show. Let's go to the top. And he didn't mean to the top of man in the mirror. He meant to the top of the show. You're kidding! Oh my gosh! Yeah. So. When you were when you were forty seconds away from having a break, you were now two hours and twenty six minutes away once again. Um, that he changed my work ethic. He raised my level of of being a vocalist, of being a vocal director, assistant musical director, of being a performer. Performer. He made everything that I thought I was so this and that, he made it even more intense. Yeah. I which uh, I, I can never, ever thank him enough for. Mm -hmm. you know, because you, you learn to be your best when you're working with the best. Yeah. You learn that you can be nothing less than great when you're working with the greatest. You know, and so I have always uh, enjoyed 
and 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 respected no matter what country we may have been in no matter uh what venue no matter no matter what i mean I, you just you learn to just 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 be i mean i i loved it all there was nothing like it i mean nothing like I mean, if I if I didn't like anything, I hate to say it was staying in the same hotel that he did, because it was it was very difficult to get rest. Because uh, I mean, you know, love the fans to death, but when it's three or four in the morning and and they're singing "We Are the World" and "Heal the World" and and all that, I kind of need some sleep so that I can help you heal the world the next night. You know, <laughs> uh, that. Um, but it was all, he, he was always fun. It was good to go, you know, shopping with him, going to the amusement parks, you know, I mean, there's nothing like going to Disneyland and, and no one is in there but us. Hmm. You don't have to wait in line. You ride anywhere, do, you know, everybody's outside. No one's in that park but us, you yeah. know, so that was always fun. And, uh, just to, you never know what it's like to be around greatness. I mean, as many times as you would think that it's so wonderful, a lot of times it's sad because when you are loved by the world, you're also misunderstood by the world. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, uh, he had to be the most misunderstood individual that I'd ever known. I mean, and unfortunately it was because you, he can't get to know everyone and everyone can't get to know him. And so when you have those who want to try and get to know him and can't, the first thing they do is go to the media and express and form their own opinion. Even if there is no, true foundation to what they're saying they've just well i didn't meet him but this is what i think and i'm going to present it as if we met yeah you know and so um so i don't have to tell you the hurtful things uh, <clears throat> that were said about him the accusations and all with people having their own underlying reasoning behind it. Some financially, some fame, some, uh, you know, just for whatever. But I mean, it's red, it's tough being on top. Yeah, people are always trying to tear him down. It is, it is very tough. It is not easy being the greatest that ever did it. I'm, I'm sorry. You people will always have their opinion, just like in sports, on who's the goat. You know, uh, when it came to that stage and his profession, I'm sorry, there was none better. Yeah. And okay. I don't think in my lifetime that I will see one that will match. Mm -hmm. He he was well. He was the king of pop, wasn't he? And mm -hmm. that. Yeah. What memorabilia or what souvenirs do you have from working with Michael? Any, you know, costumes, uh, photo books, props, anything? Um, I have, when we were doing the bad tour, I guess my biggest, yeah, sure, we have, you know, souvenirs, this, that, that, and the other. My biggest thing that I have from Michael when we were rehearsing for the bad tour, the uh, Grammy Association, Naris came to our rehearsal to uh, present him with his nominations for uh, best artists, best song, best album, best producer, uh, as far as, you know, to, for the next Grammy Awards. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all the cameras, all the hoo 
And, you know, he was, you know, thank you, thank you. But as you can see, I got work to do. Yeah. And so they finished, they were done with all that. And he had the nominations and he turned to me and said, Kevin, he said, hang on to these. I might need them one day. And I still have them. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. I still have his best producer, best, uh, best art, solo artist, best song. I still have those Grammy nominations. Incredible. Yeah. What are your current thoughts on the, you know, state of the music industry today? Are there any artists you'd like to work with that you haven't yet? Uh, as far as music, I mean, I'm sorry. I, my feeling is I, I feel that music is in a state of emergency mm -hmm. because during my era, um, music was timeless. I mean, people will listen to Michael for, I mean, just years and years and years to come, as well as other artists. You know, I think the, the next new big thing that will happen in entertainment, hopefully, will be talent. You know, something that has been lacking. Um, as far as anyone that I'd like to, to work with right now, uh, not, not necessarily. I mean, I've had a chance to, to work with some of the new artists and I, and I appreciate that, you know, yeah. um, I, I like that, you know, that it's good that your expertise is still thought of and needed. Uh, but music has changed so much. I mean, you know, from from the use of melodyne and and things of this nature, um, the industry has changed. Yeah. So I'm not one to, you know, I remember Chris Brown when when he first got started. And he was a huge Michael fan, Usher, guys like that. I mean, and then I've watched their careers and personalities kind of switch uh, along with the uh, hip hop craze, if you will. You know, so, and I've done some of the guys, I, you know, I've uh, fun working with Neo, uh, interesting working with Kanye, um, but I, I have to say, I believe the era of working with the masters and the greats, I mean, in my opinion, once again, I, I think it's over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think there'll ever come a time where, you know, something similar will happen and we'll have, you know, great artists that will be timeless? I I, I hope so, Red. Um, you, Lord knows I don't have a crystal ball to say it will happen. Uh, yeah. I would love for it to happen. I mean, I would love for kids to take up instruments again and start playing again and 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 singing again you know i have nothing against hip-hop and rap uh i don't like the element that comes with it that's in my opinion not positive i hate that people lose their lives mm -hmm. behind things of this nature yeah. um i hope that our era of music comes full circle one day yeah um and i think i think it's actually it's trying a little bit but yeah but I, I, I i don't know we have to wait and see yeah i guess we will so kevin what are you working on at the moment and what are your future ambitions um uh, i get a chance to to work on uh a lot of films uh, I have a few artists that I'm working with. Uh, one, her name is Percy, who was just submitted for a Grammy. And she wow. was in London, as a matter of fact, she and her husband, Rich. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
that's very exciting. Uh, I have a country bluegrass pop group called the Loose Strings Band. As you see, I got got their T-shirt on. As a matter of fact, awesome. <laughs> and uh, they they are an amazing, amazing group of young ladies who write sing and play and you're going to hear an awful lot about them uh another artist her name is tiffany out of my hometown in akron ohio who is also just just amazing you know so uh i'm very excited about those and they are in my future from now until uh a few film projects that I will be uh, working on and uh, which unfortunately because of NDAs I can't speak of. Uh, uh, yeah, of but um, doing that, uh, getting ready to head to Brazil uh, with a, a Michael, I, I never like to use when they say, I, he's a tribute artist, you know, they call him impersonators. He his name is Rodrigo Teaser. Yes, I've seen him online. I, I'm going to, I had the pleasure myself, Lavelle and Jennifer, worked with him in New York, Florida, and here in LA. And just a wonderful, wonderful young man. He and his wife, Priscilla, they have a, a great band and a great production staff around them. And uh, they've invited me to come to Brazil uh to to work with them and they're in Argentina. So that's gonna be fun. And naturally being dad and you know with the kids and that's always first and foremost. Yeah. You know, for me. And I have three great kids and they're doing their thing and you know, hey, doing what I do and play a little golf and and enjoy life. Excellent. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And I saw, I've seen um, videos of your show with Rodrigo um, in the US and it's just amazing. I mean, it, just seeing, you know, you and Jennifer and Lavelle with Rodrigo yeah. and hearing the fans roaring. It's just yeah. awesome. it was, uh, that's the first time I'd ever done that. And, and I never wanted to do it because I just said, uh, uh, no, no, no. And then Lavelle, Lavelle said, you know, Kevin and and then um, a uh, a young lady who was also a fan, she put us together, and uh, and I said I'd do it. And after meeting them, and like I said, so one thing he always says, listen, I'm not trying to be Michael, just showing my appreciation and my love for him and the art and music that he brought to fans worldwide. And uh, and like I said, just a, a, a great, great person yeah. that I really had fun working with and I'm looking forward to this. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, what advice would you give aspiring vocalists or someone looking for a career in the music industry? Or what would you, you know, tell your younger self? What do you know now that you wish you'd known sooner? Uh, to work ethic is king. It's king. It's like content is to movie companies. I mean, you have to be, you can't be afraid to work. Yeah. To be great, it takes hard work. Um, you have to have your own musical identity which is what kills so many of today's acts. I mean, if you close yeah. your eyes, everyone sounds the same. Yeah. You know, I mean, Michael sounded like Michael. Prince sounded like Prince. I mean, Madonna sounded like Madonna. You didn't, you didn't confuse them. No. You know, um, great writing, being a great vocalist, being on top of reading music is very important because then now you're not pigeonholed to just touring. You can come home, you can sing on film, you can sing on commercials, you can sing on television. I mean, 
It's just other ways of adding to your revenue stream, you know? And being a good person, being a smart person, always having legal counsel when you need it to protect yourself and uh, and just love what you do. I mean, there's nothing like going to work loving what you do to make a living. Yeah, that's important. But also, there's nothing in the world like being great at what you do because if you're the best at what you do, it's going to bring you to the best of what you do. And hopefully, it will take you around the world doing what you love. Mm -hmm. Fantastic advice. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you, Red. You go. Is there anything you'd like to promote or anywhere, you know, any social media where my followers, the MJ fans, can connect with you? Uh, you know, they say I have Twitter. They say I'm on, I know I'm on Facebook. I mean, I'm not a big social media guy, if you will. Yeah. But, um, yeah, just other than my artists, the Luke Strings Band and Hersey and and Tiffany and uh you know they're preparing a uh 40th anniversary thriller documentary yeah i've heard of that and uh i know i'm supposed to enter do an interview for that really? but um you know hey just keep loving music keep the magic alive continue fans to to love each other and care about each other and uh hey i look to see you guys whenever whenever i can you know that's fabulous thank, thank you much you. Red. so give your, give your family you. my best i will for sure thank you so much for being here it's been an honor learning from you hearing your stories and about well, being here and chatting with you so thank i you. hope you have a great weekend and i wish you all the best with your future projects Thank you so much, and you take care. You too.